Good morning. Nice to see all of you. Uh, if you need a Bible, we'd love to get one into your hands. Uh, please raise it, and one will be brought to you. And you can join me in John chapter 6 when you get it. And for those of you who have Bibles, please join me in John 6. If you're visiting this morning, we are thankful that you're with us and pray that you find a home in Christ or perhaps with us here. In a few moments, I'm going to read John 6, verse 35. We are in part three of this very long, lengthy, both famous and complex chapter in the Gospel of John. Our series is called Following Jesus Together, and it's in John chapter 6, all 71 verses, that Jesus explains that he is the bread of life. And so for the last two weeks we've looked at that, Jesus uh, began that conversation by performing the miracle of feeding 5,000 men, so likely 15,000 plus people, and there's a lot of teaching. His actions of providing the food elicit a sermon, and it's at this moment in the Gospel of John in which it appears the vast majority of Jesus' followers, his disciples, abandon him. They leave him. In the words we sang a few moments ago, Lord, to whom will we go? You have the words of eternal life. That was the confession of Peter. So we're at this scene where it's, it almost is as if Jesus is doing the opposite of what it, he came to do. Rather than gathering a large crowd, he had the large crowd. He preaches hard words that confuses them, and they leave him. And so we're taking a third pass this morning to look at a layer of those hard words that he preaches that appears to fall on deaf ears. So with that, I'm going to read verses 35 down to 40. Pray, and we'll look to the Lord in his word. John 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life, and whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up. On the last day, for this is the will of my father, that everyone who looks on the son and believes in him should have eternal life and it will raise him up on the last day. This is God's word. Let's pray. Jesus, you've just spoken in your word that the will of the father is that everyone who looks on the son and believes in you should have eternal life. I pray that every one of us would do that very thing even now, that we would look to you, Jesus. We would look to you in our suffering. We would look to you in our confusion. We would look to you in our hardship. We would look to you in our happiness and joy, that we would look to you for eternal life, for the removal of our sins and the giving of your goodness, your rightness, your justification to us. Lord, give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear. Spirit, unless you do those things, unless you allow us to feast on Christ's words, we can't eat them. We don't want them. So, Father, this morning, we pray that we, each of us, would continually feast on the bread of life. To that end, would you let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, and all of God's people said, amen. I had been a a believer uh, maybe a few years, three, four years. So in my early mid-twenties, engaged to my now wife. And I had many jobs during that season to support my ministry habit. I worked three or four different income streams to be a volunteer youth pastor at the church I was at. And um, one of the jobs was working at a machine shop. And that was using CNC machines to build airplane yokes, steering wheels. 
and then sand them and wash them and do different things uh, to them. And so one particular day, there was a Christian brother, and we were standing shoulder to shoulder for hours uh, working on these parts. And my brother was perplexed. He was fretting. He was concerned. He also, both in our early mid-20s, he was wrestling through this question, a question that I hadn't really thought before, and it was this. Are you the decisive factor in your salvation, or is God? That's one of the biggest questions that Christians ask, and it's also one of the most divisive questions in how we end up answering that question. Do we play varying degrees of role in bringing ourselves to salvation? Do we partner with God, or is it something that's solely of God? Well, my friend was perplexed, and the tradition that I was saved in taught and preached and presumed that I was a participant, that I brought things to the table, that I contributed to my salvation. But his question is a question that we all, at various times in our walk, ask and wrestle. And it's a tense question with tension all throughout it. Well, this morning, our aim like I said a few moments ago, is to retrace this very complex, braided, long text that is the 71 verses of John chapter 6 that we've been in now for three weeks this morning. And this time we're picking up one of those braided strands of Jesus' preaching to the crowds. His, the 12 disciples are there, the apostles, there's other disciples, there's the multitudes and looky-loos, there's all these people around And Jesus is preaching. And as I said, he's preaching a sermon in such a way that offends. And then many people depart and leave him. So we're looking at one of the strands that answers this question regarding salvation. The crowds appear deaf to what Jesus says. But the disciples, by the end of the chapter, appear to receive it. And the specific strand is Jesus' teaching on why The crowds would not believe him. They did not want to. They left him. And yet, why the small band of the twelve would stay and would believe? Did the disciples, the twelve, the apostles, were they more intelligent than the crowds? And that's why they stayed? Did they have more information than the crowds? Well, they did see Jesus walk on the water the night before. But in terms of teaching, they did have more position, but they didn't really have much more than what the crowds heard. Did the disciples have a better disposition that predisposed them to following Jesus, whereas the crowds didn't? Were the apostles a better type of person? (coughs) Excuse me. Well, the text is going to answer this morning no to all of those questions. No, the disciples were not more intelligent. They didn't have more information. They didn't have a better disposition. Jesus, in John 6, pulls back the curtains of salvation on the biblical story to give us a behind-the-scenes, God's-eye view on why some believe for salvation and others don't, why some will eat his flesh and drink his blood, see last week, and some will will not. Scripture's clear. Deuteronomy 29.29, there Moses says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. In other words, God has not disclosed every detail of how his plan of the gospel works. Nor would we expect him to do so, though we would like him to do so. Nor has God in his infinite greatness communicated every inexhaustible detail about himself to us, his finite creatures. Scripture is entirely comfortable letting tensions lie where we try to put things together that are hard to put together because the secret things belong to the Lord. So in other words, there are wonderful and marvelous things Scripture teaches about God, his gospel plan that we have a hard time fitting together and reconciling. And when our emotions get entangled in them, and they so often do, our emotions can also add to that difficulty. 
We're not just cerebral robots. We are feeling and creatures. But arguably, chief among these marvelous things and confusing things that God has not disclosed how it perfectly works from our vantage point is salvation. Namely, who is decisive? Does salvation finally rest fully with you or with God? Well, let's look at the text this morning. Our outline comes to us in three parts. Here they are if you're taking notes. Like I said, we're looking at a a braided strand. So unlike the past two weeks where we've walked passage by passage through the text, now we're going to be looking at some key statements of Jesus and fitting them together. So point number one, the Father gives us to the Son. We'll look at three verses for that. The beginning of verse 37, the beginning of verse 44, and verse 65. The Father gives us to the Son. Next, Jesus teaches, point number two, the Son protects and preserves all the Father gives. That's, again, the second half of verse 37 and verse 39. And then we're going to conclude our time this morning by looking at three results or three implications, three ways that what Jesus teaches result in us feasting on the bread of life. What does it do to us and how should we live given what Jesus teaches regarding salvation here? Well, let's jump right into the first point. The Father, excuse me, gives us to the Son. Look at the verse 37, verses 44, and verse 65. Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And then down to verse 44, Jesus continues. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. And verse 65, a third time, Jesus says, And this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's granted to him by the Father. And Jesus said that as the multitudes were leaving him. Look at verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. What is Jesus saying? 100%, 100% of the people, God the Father gives to God the Son, will come to the Son. Jesus says in verse 37, note that word, all, all that the Father gives to me, and note this word, will come to me. 100% of the people God gives to Jesus will come to Jesus. When Jesus says all the Father gives will come, there's no wiggle room in there of resistance, of uncertainty, or the like. The Father will will give a people to his son, every person he wants to give, he will give. Jesus says in verse 37. And in verse 44, verse 44, Jesus gives us the opposite vantage point. Look at what Jesus says from the negative. No one can come to me, and here's the condition, unless, and what's the condition? The Father who sent me, draws him. No one can come to me. Sheer inability, impenetrable wall, no desire, no one can come to me. Here's the condition, unless the Father draws him. That's verse 44. In other words, 100% of people cannot come to Jesus unless the Father draws him. And in case we missed it, down in verse 65, Jesus closes his message with the disciples saying, this is why I told you no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Of course, these words of Jesus here echo John the Apostle's words in the first chapter of John. Do you remember verses 12 and 13 in chapter 1? Where where the Apostle says, but to, to all who did receive Jesus who believed in his name, 
Jesus gave the right to become children of God. Okay? They received him. But look at verse 13. Who were born not of blood, meaning default ethnic descent. Their ethnicity didn't determine whether or not they came to Christ. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, meaning in our fallen Adam-like state, nor of the will of man, meaning any human desire, but of God. So again, all who believed in his name, Jesus gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. So people in John 1 are not born again as children of God into the kingdom of God because they willed and wanted it. That's what all those nors were. But because God willed and wanted it. This is also explicit in Romans 8, 7. Would you please join me in Romans 8, 7? In Romans 8, 7, the Apostle Paul is making a contrast between flesh and spirit. And the Apostle Paul is using flesh similar to John in his gospel, meaning the um, unregenerate self. That is, is somebody who's not been born again. In Romans 8, 7, the Apostle says this, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. So it's not a, we refer to mindsets attitudes. That, that's not what he's referring to. He's distinguishing you're either full of the Holy Spirit or you're not. And so he says, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God for two things. It does not submit to God's law and indeed it cannot. So in Romans 8, 7, the apostle says, does not, that's a matter of the will. The heart does not want. And then when it says cannot, that's a matter of ability. So even if someone had the ability to come to Jesus, they would never want to 100% of the time because the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to his law. 100% of the time, Romans 8, 7, even if there was an ability and there wasn't, The heart outside of Christ will not ever want to submit to God's law. And the same truth is found in Ephesians 1, verses 4 and 5. Look at, listen to this, saying of the Father, even as he, the Father, chose us in Jesus before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, the Father predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. We looked at this some time ago when we went through the book of Ephesians. But what we see in Ephesians is that Scripture uses a constellation of terms to describe what God does in saving people. In Ephesians, we we heard the word choose in verse 4 and predestined in verse 5. Five, another fairly common title that's used of Christians, right? We're called believers, we're, we're called different names, Christians. But did you know a fairly common title in many books of the New Testament for you is the elect. That's one of the titles of Christians. This does not mean in saying that you're the elect. It doesn't mean that God voted for you and he's hoping for a good outcome. It means that God selected and chose. So, for example, many verses can be multiplied. We'll look at one. It's a beautiful passage. 2 Timothy 2.10. Again, the Apostle Paul, he is writing about his ministry and, and what it means for him to live as a follower of Jesus. And he says this, and I think that what he says here we all should adopt. He says, Therefore I... Endure everything for the sake of the elect. That they also may obtain salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Just real brief, 
Remember, this is the man who's been shipwrecked multiple times, bitten by snakes. He has been beaten and flogged, left for dead, stoned, spit on, ostracized. And he says that all of the punishments and beatings and illegal trials, all the suffering, all the surface, his entire life was for one purpose. I endure everything for the sake of the elect. Why? Because there's people that the Father has chosen who've not yet come to Christ, and therefore he knows they will come to Christ, and so he endures what he endures for the elect to come to Jesus and be saved, and then also grow to be more like Jesus. So there are these words that we've been exposed to. Ephesians 1, choose, predestined. Here in 2 Timothy 2, a title for Christians, the elect. This is what we call in systematic theology the doctrine of election. Sometimes people trip up over words like predestined and election as if it's not a Bible word, as if it's some ivory tower uh, systematic theology word from the camp of the bad guys. But it's actually Bible. It's Bible words. But we put an umbrella called the doctrine of election and hang all these verses under that umbrella to get a picture of what does it mean when God says this. And the doctrine of election, as we've seen here, teaches that God chooses and gives people to Jesus. So Augustine did not make up the doctrine of election. Believe it or not, John Calvin did not make up The doctrine of election, although Jesus may have been reading the Institutes. Not sure. So as John 6 reveals our election, going back to Jesus' words, no one comes to the Father, or no one comes to me unless the Father gives him. John 6 reveals that our election, the Father giving us to the Son, is not conditioned on anything in us nor resisted by us. We can only offer our sin at the foot of the cross and see Jesus' blood dripping from that cross on our behalf. We bring sin to the table. Or to use older language, we are totally depraved. We are not as bad as we possibly can be, but all of us is as bad as it can be. Put differently, Every part of our human person is infected, stained, and defined by sin. Our emotions, our thoughts, our desires, our actions. That's why back in the Romans 8-7 passage, we are unable and unwilling to come to God. And that's why Jesus later says at the end of verse 63, the flesh is no help at all. So in other words, the reason... We, nothing, our salvation is not conditioned upon us. And the reason that it, we can't resist it is because we are dead in our sins and we have nothing to give but our sin and the flesh is no help at all. So then our election by God, therefore, is unconditional and graciously irresistible. But how does this work? Look again at verse 37 verse 44, and verse 65. There are three terms that Jesus uses. So, for example, in verse 37, it says the Father gives to the Son. Gives. In verse 44, the Father draws. No one can come to the Father. Excuse me. No one can come to the Son unless the Father draws him. And then again in verse 65, it says, This is why I told you no one can come to the Father. Excuse me, I keep messing this up. Verse 65. This is why I told you no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. Jesus says, gives, draws, and granted. These three terms describe the action of the Father doing something with people to Christ. Gives, draws and grants. What do those words mean? Gives is a straightforward term. And it means that the father possesses something and then the father hands it over or gifts it to Jesus. So verse 37, 
all that the Father gives me will come to me. But what about the next term, draws? The Greek term behind this word is translated three ways in English. Just a side note here, a little technicality. When you're reading and studying your Bible and you come across words, to be a faithful interpreter of the Bible, we use the Bible to interpret the Bible. And when we come across words that maybe are hard to understand, you look up how that term is used elsewhere in the Bible to get a portrait of what it means. You read it in its context. That helps you understand. So when it says that no one can come to me, when Jesus says no one can come to me, verse 44, unless the Father who sent me draws him, what does that mean? Does it mean that the Father is kind of wooing and enticing us? To come to the Father? Does it mean something else? Well, this word, the Greek word here, is used three main ways in the New Testament. In John 21, 7, in John 21, 7, uh, the end of this gospel, Jesus has resurrected. He has atoned for our sins. He's resurrected for our justification. The disciples are fishing. Jesus stands on the shore. They've been fishing. They can't, didn't catch any fish. He tells them to cast the net on the other side of the boat. They cast the net, and then they have a huge catch, and they haul it into the boat. It's the same word in the Greek. They haul the fish into the boat, John 21, 7. Or, let's back up closer to this text, John 18, 10. Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is about to be captured. A mini melee breaks out. A little war breaks out. What does Peter do? Peter grabs his sword and draws it out of its sheath and cuts off the ear of the servant. It's the same word as no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. Peter drawing his sword out of the sheath. And finally, in Acts 16, 19. Acts 16, 19 Paul and Silas are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, calling people to turn from their sins, believe in, the, in Jesus, and receive the free grace that he offers that made the crowds angry and upset. And so they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace. And that word dragged is the same word in the Greek. So when Jesus, here in verse 44, says, No one can come to me, unless the Father who sent me draws him. And all the references that we see elsewhere in Scripture, hauling fish into the boat, drawing a sword out of its sheath, and dragging them before the magistrates. Well, one commentator says this. The key verb draw implies that an object being moved is incapable of propelling itself. Swords don't draw themselves. And nets don't jump into the boat. They're incapable of propelling themselves, or in this case, persons unwilling to do so voluntarily. Paul and Silas did not want to be dragged and beaten in the marketplace. The commentator continues, There is not one example in the New Testament of the use of this word draw in which there is resistance that is successful. So maybe Paul and Silas were resisting being dragged into the marketplace, but it was unsuccessful resistance. So in other words then, when Jesus says draw, draw is not at odds with gives. The Father gives people to the Son, and here in this verse, draw does not mean woo. It does not mean entice. Draw just describes the act of God moving us from one place to another, namely to Jesus. So the word draw emphasizes our experience of salvation. Maybe 10,000 gospel conversations. Maybe many apologetic conversations. Maybe much prayer from our vantage point going from hating Jesus to desiring Jesus. That's the drawing. But it's not us. It's the Father drawing us. It describes our experience of salvation. And lastly gives, draws, and grants from verse 65. That word grant, make, for us, sounds like allow. This person wants something, so God's going to allow it to happen. That's also not what it means, because the word grant in verse 65 is the exact same word from verse 37, gives. 
is the exact same word in Greek to make it easier for us to understand in English puts the word grant. In other words, it's giving. It's the same term. So all three terms, give, draw, and grant, are all functionally similar describing the act of the Father giving a specific people to Jesus. So, it would be an interpretive mistake to think that the words draw or grant imply that there is a contribution or condition on my part that there's something in me in my fallen state that I can give or add to participate in my salvation. Rather, give, draw, and grant underscore my unwillingness and my inability to be saved apart from the work of the Father giving me to the Son. And this is the mistake that John Wesley made. For as amazing and blessed as an evangelist as he was, John Wesley made the mistake of embracing Jacob Arminius's teaching of prevenient grace. That is, a teaching that God gives just enough grace to overcome our spiritual depravity and death. Just enough grace. Just enough grace to enable, but not ensure. So that's the key phrase in this system of thought, of prevenient grace that John Wesley taught, is that from the cross, Jesus gives to all people just enough grace to enable you to choose God independent of God, but it won't ensure that you're saved. Just enough grace to enable, but not ensure, personal acceptance of the gift of salvation. That's the language that's used from that system. So in prevenient grace that John Wesley preached, the final deciding factor of salvation is not God. For Wesley, it is you and me. Somehow it works out in the system that, yes, God gave enabling grace, but it's not ensuring grace. And therefore, I am, independent of God, able to choose God. So Wesley taught. So God gave enough grace to nudge me, but I'm the determining agent of my salvation. God is not. So my salvation under Wesley is finally determined by me, not God. So God can offer salvation, but he doesn't actually save. Does that sound biblical? God is in this system like a firefighter who opens the door and calls you to come out, but won't go in to pick up your lifeless body to bring you out. Because in the system, you're actually not a lifeless body. You're still fully fallen, but somehow have enough grace. God is like a lifeguard who reaches out his hand while you're drowning, but doesn't actually dive into the pool to rescue you under the system of prevenient grace. So, so why am I pointing this out? Because this system and various species of this belief is the default common level, pew level belief system of many churches. This system is adopted by free will Baptists, the denomination of Methodists, Wesleyans, Nazarenes, nearly all charismatic churches, of which I got saved in one, and many non-denominational churches may not know the phrase prevenient grace, but operationally and functionally have this belief. But here we're taking Jesus' words and comparing it to this, this idea. And Wes, is Wesley's view biblical and true? The answer is no, it is not. He is mistaken. We saw that give, draw, and grant all describe exegetically in Scripture, meaning we're drawing meaning from the text contextually and lexically. That's a fancy way of saying definitions. That give, draw, and grant all describe God's unilateral and decisive action 
to save his elect, not based on anything foreseen in us or in us or by us, but God's sovereign and loving purpose. Wesley's view of prevenient grace, as interesting as it may be, is not only not found in Scripture, it contradicts Scripture, especially John 6 that we're focusing on this morning. And I'm going to suggest this. By teaching that salvation is finally and fully my responsibility and my ability, um, enabled but not insured by grace, I'm going to say this. It robs our triune God in Christ of the glory of actually being a Savior who saves. Because God's not a firefighter who stands at the door. He runs into the fire, dies in your place to get you out of the fire. He's a lifeguard who swims and gets your lifeless body already drowned, right? Because actually we're not active drowning victims or we're not stuck in a fire. We're dead in the fire and dead in our drowning. And God has to do the work of bringing us from death to life and dark to light. So scripture is clear. Going back to verse 37, Jesus says, All that the Father gives to me will come to me. And verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So now, point number two, let's look at the Son's role in salvation. That was the longest point, by the way. (laughs) That was all introduction. We've looked at the Father giving and drawing. What about Jesus? The Son, point number two, protects and preserves all the Father gives. Now, of course, in John 6, think about where we are in in this passage. John 6, Jesus is on the road to the cross. He hasn't taken our sins upon the cross yet. He has not risen. He's not been buried. He hasn't been risen from the grave yet. So here in this passage, we're awaiting his cross work. But look at what he says in verse 37b, the second half. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. And and look at verse 39. That I should lose nothing of all the Father has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Listen to Jesus' beautiful words. Look at, have your eyes on verse 37 and verse 39. Jesus is saying 100% of the people the Father gives to Jesus, Jesus will receive and Jesus will never cast out. 100% of the people the Father draws to Jesus will not be lost. 100% of the people the Father gives to Jesus, Jesus will most assuredly raise to eternal life. This means there is no disunity in the Trinity's gospel plan or, note this, insecurity for the believer. We can be, you, my friend, can be assured we belong to Christ and we can be assured that he will never lose us and Jesus will never cast us out. Let me remind you of a familiar verse. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Jude 24, 24. That is true because the previous point is true. Because God chooses and saves his elect, therefore we have the assurance, Jesus says, indicating that he will not lose any of us. Now, we're going to look at this in a little bit, but notice assurance of salvation and our perseverance of the saints does not depend upon you. Who's the agent in these verses of Jesus' words? Jesus is. Our ability to be assured of our salvation and our ability to persevere as saints is not our ability. It does not rest on you or depend upon you. Looking to ourselves for assurance of salvation and looking to ourselves to persevere is the wrong place to look. We are not our own source of 
or substance of assurance Jesus is. No, what we do because of these words in John 6, we look up and out to the Father who gave us to the Son and to the Son who promises to never become so careless and inattentive so as to lose you. The Son who promises to never become so fed up with you, so disappointed with you, so over it, because you messed up again and again, that Jesus decides to give up and cast you out. This means, in John 6, Jesus' words, that a true Christian cannot lose their salvation, precisely because their salvation does not depend upon them. If a Christian can lose their salvation, then verse 39 is false. When Jesus says, I should lose nothing of all the Father has given me, but raise it up on the last day. If we can lose our salvation, if we can unborn again ourselves, unsheep ourselves, turn ourselves back into goats, or anything else, Jesus is wrong and mistaken. And that has severe implications on our Christology. That has severe implications on our Bible because that would mean that the Bible is wrong, and specifically Jesus is wrong, and therefore Jesus is not a Savior and God in the flesh. He's a charlatan and liar. Jesus did not die for the possibility of salvation. Jesus died for the actuality and security of your salvation. And to that we say, praise God. Because verse 39 is true. Jesus will not lose us. He will lose none of us and will raise us up on that last day. In Christ we are secure. In Jesus we are assured. And in Jesus we are preserved. And this leads us then to our third and final point, the conclusion. So what? Now... Here's what I haven't done. I I didn't go to my shelf and pull out a systematic theology and open it up and just start reading systematic theology. We are on our third long pass through the 71 verses of John chapter 6. Jesus is preaching these words. He is preaching these words to over 15,000 people. And he says to them, none of you can come to me. Unless the Father draws you. And all the Father gives to me will come to me. This is a sermon. And he is evangelizing. And in doing this, the multitudes and even the disciples, remember what they do? They murmur and they grumble. And they turn their backs on Jesus and they leave. Because of these words. So this is not seminary stuff. It's Tuesday morning stuff. What then do these doctrines produce? Remember, Jesus turns to the disciples and he looks at them, the apostles, the twelve, and he says, do you you want to go away as well? Because not only has Jesus taught and preached, you must drink my blood and eat my flesh, that was last week, but he has woven into that braid the reason they're not eating his flesh and drinking his blood is because the Father did not give them to him, to Jesus, and Jesus tells them that. And they are offended. And so they leave. They leave. But look at verse 57. Jesus says, As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. And there's a beautiful play on words here where <clears throat> Jesus is the word made flesh. In a verse 63, he talks about how the, his words are, are spirit and life. And feeding on Jesus, we know from last week, is having faith in Jesus. It's believing what he says. So in conclusion then, life in Christ and the eternal life that he promises is not just duration. Do you know that? We hear the words eternal life and we think forever. That's exactly what it means. 
But it means so much more than that. Eternal life, life in Christ, is not just duration of life, it's quality of life. And eternal life is not just a future thing, it's a now reality because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and our being born again in his outpouring of the Spirit. So we are called by Jesus to feast on him, the bread of life in John 6. And feasting on him is believing all of his words, what he says and what he says about himself and what he does. So to feast on the bread of life is to believe what Jesus says and who Jesus is. So here's my question. What kind of person do these gospel truths produce? Or rather, what are they intended to produce? Doctrine of unconditional election, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints, and more. A sour prude. Do you think? No? Let me give you three. What does this teaching produce? What does what Jesus says intended to nourish our body to make in you? Number one, the doctrine of election produces gospel hope and assurance. The doctrine of election produces gospel hope and assurance. What do I mean? These things that Jesus is preaching to the crowds that offend them are meant to assure you of the security of your salvation. We all at different ways in different times have our doubts. We're prone to looking, to navel-gazing, looking at ourselves, turning Christianity into a self-righteous, works-based performance, holier-than-thou, comparing ourselves against others, and we either are full of pride or full of despair. And these words of Jesus are meant to take us out of ourselves and fix our eyes on Jesus. We're weak. We have remaining sin. We have folly. We're prone to wander as we sing. The savoriness of the bread of life isn't always appetizing to us. There are things that are more tantalizing. And oftentimes they could be good things that we turn into ultimate things or just outright caving into sin. And so many of us then walk with low-grade unassurance. We're not confident that we're in Christ. And we doubt that we are in him. We, we begin to worry that maybe I'm not the elect and maybe I'm a false convert or something along those lines. When you believe that Christ holds you fast, when the anchor of your faith is not rooted in your performance, but the anchor of in your faith is in Jesus and his performance and his words where he promises to never let us go, when you have concern about being in Jesus, when, when you fret and are sorrowful that your love for the Savior isn't as warm as you want it to be, but you're not exactly sure how to kindle those fires again, when deep down you don't want to leave Jesus, those doubts themselves and those difficulties themselves are evidence that you are in fact filled with the Spirit and saved. Because part of Jesus promising to hold us fast and never let us go, is to allow us to go through seasons of difficulty and doubt. But the source of those desires is not sourced in us. They're a gift of the Spirit. The Father has given you to the Son. So faith, then, is not primarily making it about me. I am not supposed to have faith in the strength of my faith, I am supposed to have faith in the strength of Jesus' grip on me and looking to Christ. In other words, the doctrine of assurance of salvation beckons you to look to Jesus and believe that he holds you securely when you doubt and when you feel like your love is lukewarm. You look to Jesus and in doing so, 
we show that we have that faith. He is preserving you through every storm and doubt. Assurance calls us to fix our eyes on the work of the cross, not our work as a Christian. And that's possible only because the Father gave us to the Son. That's only possible. In the system of what Wesley promotes, of the prevenient grace, where I have just enough of grace to enable but not ensure, in those systems, they believe that you can lose your salvation because you are the one who is the decider of your salvation. And there's various ways of articulating that. But that is not what Jesus says. He will lose none. So Christian, treasure Treasure this morning. Be strengthened this morning. Treasure your assurance in the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, whose eternal love chose you and gave you to the Son. It turns out Jesus is a sturdy Savior. And it turns out Romans 8.39 is still in your Bible. You may need to check. But it does still say in mine, nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And that love is not just a sentiment and emotion that he has for you. It is a saving love. And when nothing says nothing, it actually means nothing. That includes you. You can't separate yourself from the love of God as in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So the doctrine of election produces gospel hope and assurance in Jesus. That's what this teaching is meant to produce. Number two, two of three, the doctrine of election produces gospel humility and happiness. When you rightly recognize that the Bible clearly teaches that you were dead in your trespasses and sins, desireless of God, And yet now you sit here this morning, hands lifted, hearts elevated, full of love for the Savior, singing words that are delicious to your mouth as you praise the Lord for Him loving you. When you recognize the Bible teaches this, that you're unable to come to Him, and more than that, unwilling, and you recognize that your change of heart was not because of you, but because graciously of Him, that out of sheer grace and eternal love the Father gave you to Jesus through the Spirit, That creates not humility. It creates humility. It doesn't create pride. It kills pride. It kills pride. Because humility recognizes that all credit goes to God. It's a healthy thing at times to ask, why me? Not because of difficulty in your life, but because of God's love and grace in your life. Why me? Because the moment we begin to say, well, I'm, and we begin to think there's something in us, we show that we don't understand the gospel. And so when we recognize that we have been brought by adoption into the love of the Father, that does two things. It humbles us and it makes us happy. A soul happiness despite circumstances. It's a humility that recognizes that all credit goes to God and all boasting is actually praise directed to Him, nothing in myself. But here's what it also does. It, yes, it produces, the doctrine of election produces gospel humility and happiness, but don't you recognize, this, recognize that it changes how you relate to and view every other Christian and every other unsaved person? In your humility... It cultivates love that all the other people who claim to love Christ, they also, like you, were once unable, unwilling. That means that every person you see who loves Jesus is a trophy of grace who's in process of being transformed into Christ's likeness. And that means that your friends around you, every person in the church, even people that you may not like in the church, people who annoy you in the church, people who you think are difficult in the church, people who you love in the church, every person becomes an emblem of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his electing love. 
And that creates humility. It creates wonder. It creates awe because you're in a room of people who are all messed up, all in process, and none of us can take credit for ourselves. That we are like the prodigal son. And that when we find ourselves drifting towards being like the self-righteous older brother, we remember the doctrine of election and recognize that we were prodigal, but by God's grace, we are here. That also means then that, and we'll see this in the next point, that even your unbelieving friends and family who you extend hospitality to, to show the love of Jesus and share the gospel with them and you hang out with, they may be elect. You see, from our vantage point on the stage of redemptive history, it may take 10,000 gospel conversations, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of hours of prayer and, and losing friendships and regaining friendships and, and more. You guys have heard the story of my mom when she worked in hospice as an evangelist sharing the gospel with 90-year-old cantankerous men repenting on their deathbeds with tears in their eyes, turning to Jesus because their sweet Christian wife who preceded them to glory shared the gospel for 50 years and they were jerks to their wives and then they got saved and now they're going to go apologize and hug their wife in heaven. (laughs) Don't be a jerk to your wife. Look to the doctrine of election to recognize there's nothing in you to humble you to love your wife as Christ loved the church. That's not on my notes. <laughs> Number three, the doctrine of election. So it doesn't only produce gospel humility and happiness. It only produces gospel hope and assurance. The doctrine of election produces gospel mission. It is true that in the history of the church, There have been pockets of Christians, periods of history, who have gone horribly wrong with the doctrine of election saying that we shouldn't even evangelize. That's stupid. That's nonsense. That's not a good reading of the Bible. God uses means. Just as he uses the means of prayer to accomplish his providence, you have not because you ask not, We pray God does it because it was his will. In a similar way, God uses our faithful evangelism and proclamation of the gospel to draw and give people to Jesus. If God has most certainly elected individuals to eternal life, and he has, then do you recognize that our our evangelism is motivated by the promise of a 100% success rate? Acts 18, 9 through 11. Paul is being beaten. He's discouraged. So Jesus comes to him in a night vision and says this. And the Lord said to Paul, this is Acts 18, 9. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you to harm you for, and listen to what Jesus says, I have many in this city who are my people. That's an evangelistic statement. That Paul is to preach the gospel because there's elect who God will in his wisdom, we don't know how it works, will save when they eventually believe the gospel. And so verse 11, Paul stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. From our perspective, as I said, it could take 10,000 gospel conversations, but God created the world in which he uses means to accomplish his purposes. And so when we know then the doctrine of election, that means that we tell the gospel to the whole world and never give up and always preach all over the place, beginning with our Jerusalem, calling people to repentance to the glorious Savior who bore our sins on the cross and rose from the grave. We preach, we preach, we pray, and we go to sleep peacefully. Trusting that God will give people to his son. And it's an error to think that your mission is just to evangelize the lost. It's an error to think that your mission 
is to evangelize only the lost. Your mission as a Christian is also to bless and build the local church. We are not the frozen chosen. We build the church by using our time, talents, and resources to advance the gospel in the lives of one another through service, generosity, and helping one another know and follow Jesus. Do you realize that your mission too? You see, the mission is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. The mission is not to evangelize. Do you see the difference? Matthew 28 says, Go into all the world and make disciples. Not converts, make disciples. The same gospel we preach to see someone go from death to life is the same gospel we never stop preaching, which is the mode and motivation to transform us into light, into Christ likeness. The gospel is not just for justification, the gospel is for sanctification. And the church goes wrong when we forget that. So we advance the gospel by evangelizing the lost to get saved and join the church. And we evangelize the saved because the promises and provisions of the gospel remain the instrument the Spirit uses to mature us individually and corporately into Christ's likeness. Remember, the gospel is meant to make and shape disciples of Jesus Christ. And the biblical proof of these three conclusions... The doctrine of election produces gospel hope and assurance. The doctrine of election produces gospel humility and happiness. And the doctrine of election produces gospel mission. The proof of these is the disciples. This is a sermon. And we see their lives in the book of Acts and beyond. Jesus preached these truths in John 6. And they confess, Lord, to whom shall we go? This is verse 68 in John 6. You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Friends, what we call in systematic theology the doctrines of total depravity, unconditional election, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints, and more are drawn from John 6. And they are words of eternal life. And they're words that turned people away and brought people into the kingdom. They are aspects of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's these words that Jesus preaches in John 6 that led to the salvation and transformed lives of the disciples at the foot of the cross and the empty tomb. And they should do the same for us, what it did for them. And so I leave you with this. What will you do with these gospel truths from the mouth of Jesus? Will you say to him, you have the words of eternal life. To whom will we go? Or will you say to him, murmuring and grumbling, and turn your back on him and leave? Amen. Amen. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. We recognize, Lord, that you have commissioned us to preach your gospel, to love the lost, to love the saved. You have given us a mission and work to do because you have not brought us home to glory. And so these truths, Lord Jesus, humble us. And so, Lord, humble us. And these truths, Lord, teach us that you, Lord, are sovereign in salvation and you, Lord, love. And so let us be instruments of your love to every single man, woman, and child until you bring us home for your glory, our joy, and their good. Pray this in Jesus' name.